Okay, so as promised, I'd like to talk about some of the ways that since the auto cycle came out, it has been sort of modified or changed to do um, almost the same thing, but in a slightly different way. And sometimes that's for power gains or efficiency or just because maybe it's an interesting change. And uh, the first thing that I wanna talk about is the Atkinson cycle. That is one of the most famous, one of the two most famous sort of modifications on the auto cycle. So, Atkinson, and then I'll also say slash Humphrey, because sometimes this is called the Atkinson-Humphrey cycle. So we'll give Humphrey some credit too on this, okay. Um, what I have up here on the board is the auto cycle from last lecture. So the, both of these diagrams should look familiar. There's nothing new here. And what I want to do is look at the modifications that we make to this in order to get the auto. So real quick, let's jot down what the steps we have um, here are. So going one to two, that's isentropic. Compression. Going from two to three, that's isochoric heat addition. So while we're here at the isochoric heat addition, I want to label this diagram. So two to three. Q in, this is where it's happening, and then up here. Q in, or two to three, okay? Now from three to four, we have isentropic expansion. Again, this is, you know, the volume's growing again from three to four. And now we have step four to one, and I'm not gonna fill it in yet because this is the path that we're gonna change from step four to step one. We're going to do it differently. Now, when people started looking at this, Atkinson in particular, so Atkinson was looking at this cycle that Otto had come up with, and he said, hmm, how can I change this to make it more um, efficient, perhaps at the loss of a little bit of work? So he wasn't afraid to lose work. Now you'll remember the work done by this cycle, the network, is the area enclosed, okay? So if you were to make the area here any smaller, you would lose a little bit of work. But again, Atkinson wasn't afraid to do that. So what we're gonna actually do is we are gonna lose a little bit of area, but it's gonna gain us some efficiency. And here's how. This step from four to one right now is isochoric. It actually happens at a volume, this is V4, okay? It's the volume at state four. Instead of doing it isochorically, here's the punchline. We are going to do it, and I'll do this in green, isobarically, okay? So we're gonna cut across and create a new one, state one, but the green version. And then you can see how from here, we can just continue the cycle. Now, are we losing area? Yes, we're losing this much area, so we're losing that much work out from the cycle. Um, what have we gained? Well, here's what we've gained. Notice that now on this um, intake and exhaust, these intake and exhaust strokes that go back and forth from state zero to state one. These were two strokes, all right? And they were only there to get the fuel into the system. This now moves up, right? Because we're now operating up here at a slightly higher pressure, okay? So this moves up, but what it also does is it gets shortened. So what happens is that this stroke right here, which is the intake stroke, is again from, and I'll do, I should be doing this in green, 
pardon me, let me do this in green. This is state zero. Going to the intake stroke is now shortened. It doesn't have to expand all the way out to this volume. It only expands up to this volume, which is, uh, I'll mark on the axis with black, this is V1 now. And now V1 is different than V4. And then as before, out here at the edge, we had V2, okay? So now there are three volumes in play. Instead of just these two here, we now have one V1 here in the middle. And that difference of the intake not expanding all the way means that our exhaust stroke is longer because it goes all the way, right? From state four, all the way exhausting back to state zero, all the way along the bottom. The exhaust stroke is longer than the intake stroke. I hope you can see that. On each cycle, start at one, go around, come back to four, exhaust stroke, exhaust stroke, exhaust stroke, coming all the way back. And now intake stroke only going there. So we're saving ourselves a little bit of space on the intake stroke. The way this is done um, in practice is on the intake valve, the timing is played with. And to build one of these Atkinson engines, the timings have to be controlled very precisely because I'm sure some of you know how hard the timings are to get right on just a normal auto engine. And this has got to be even more details. The timing is such that the uh, entire cylinder fills up, but then the valve doesn't close right away. The valve is delayed, held open from the start at the start of this cycle. So what that means is that it never reaches the full, it never gets back to the full compression that it was at. The, the um, I wrote it down how I wanted to say it. The cylinder is never completely filled with that air fuel mixture that comes in from the intake valve. So again, we lose a little bit of work out of our cycle, but because of that fact that the shortened intake stroke um, is in the cycle, we gain some efficiency and that bears itself out in the formula. So this last step here, what have we done now? We've got an ISO bar from four to one. So four to one is now isobaric heat removal or heat rejection. Okay, I'm gonna underline isobaric to emphasize that from the auto cycle, this is the one thing that we've changed now in this Atkinson cycle. All right, so we need to see this in the efficiency. How does the efficiency change? Well, before we had one compression ratio. It was R, and it was the ratio of V1 to V2. I wanna make sure I get this right, it still is. So V1 to V2 is the compression ratio. Now, what have we done? We have actually made the compression ratio smaller, okay? That's another way of saying what I've been trying to say here. It used to be one to two, so it was this full distance. Now, the compression ratio is one to two. It's only that distance. So the compression ratio is lower, and we talked about how for a normal auto uh, engine in a vehicle these days, the compression ratio is between 10 and 14. Well, for an Atkinson engine, it's typically around eight. So it's much lower than even the lowest of the auto engines. We've made it smaller. However, that distance that it expanded, right, when it goes, when it goes from here to here, um, in other words, when it goes from bottom dead center to top dead center. Um, what's it called? Expansion, yeah, the expansion ratio. That has not changed. So we need a new letter to denote that. And we'll use RE, the ratio for expansion. That is still this to this. So that now it's V4. V4 over V2. This is the expansion ratio.
So notice how basically in, in last in the auto cycle, the last cycle we studied, these were the same. There was no difference. Compression ratio, expansion ratio, because it compressed and expanded the same amount, there was just one number. Now we've got to distinguish between them. I hope that's the point I'm making clear. There's two things now to worry about. And so when we do the formula for the efficiency, I'm going to write it down here. Um, efficiency... Atkinson. Um, first, I'll write down a version that uses the temperatures in case we need them. Cp T1 T3 over T2 raised to the power of Cv over Cp all minus 1 over Cv T2 in brackets T3 over T2 minus 1. That terrible looking thing, that's in terms of temperatures, and I can rewrite it in terms of our new, of course, compression ratio and our new expansion ratio, and it's a little bit better. We have Cp, Re minus R, and on the bottom is Cv, Re, and this is raised to the power of Cp over Cv minus R, the Cp over Cv. Okay, so these are two different ways of writing it. I prefer this way using the compression ratios. It's a little bit neater and easier for me to think about. So in the derivation of this, obviously you would see how does that get introduced and whatever. But the upside of all this is that we have a system that has higher efficiency, but we have a power loss or a work because our cycle loses a little bit of work. So we have a power loss, and that specifically comes through when you build this and put it in an engine, when you're at low speeds. So that's why it didn't work really well for a gasoline engine, because even though it's nice and all with higher efficiency, you've got that power loss. However, this cycle is perfect for hybrids. So most vehicles today that are hybrids out there on the road use an Atkinson cycle. It looks exactly like this. I could just be super clear, finish it off, outlining it in green. It follows the, follows the auto cycle the rest of the way, okay? But that's what it looks like. Um, just a couple more notes. So that was one note here. Uh, what, what else do I want to say? Notice that this cycle, as we've constructed it, what we did is we took an auto cycle and we changed one step and we made this Atkinson cycle. There's actually another cycle that's only one step away from this. And that's this step. If we were to have changed this, the isochoric step, into isobaric as well, in other words, take auto and change both of them, well then, we're gonna get the Rankine cycle or the Brayton cycle. So. This is, I'll put a star there and come down here. This is also one step away from the Rankine or Brayton cycle. And so sometimes online you'll see discussions of people comparing this uh, Atkinson cycle with the Brayton. And so that's what's up with that. It's really, it's very similar to that one as well. It's got connections to both the auto and the Brayton. Um, again, we talked about it's more efficient with a fixed expansion ratio than the auto cycle is. And then if you use it with a supercharger, or a turbocharger, which is a different, really a supercharger is a broader category and a turbocharger is a kind of supercharger, but used with any supercharger, it's called a Miller engine. So if you hear that term, Miller engine, just think Atkinson cycle with a supercharger on it, okay? And the supercharger, of course, for those of you who don't know, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't affect the thermodynamics of it, okay? Um, 
What else did I want to say about this? I feel like that's probably good for right now. So notice where this falls here on this diagram. We have our, this, this is the diagram I had up last time. We have our auto cycle here and we're gonna get two, there's two main cycles that are deviations of this and this is one of them. The Atkinson cycle. Um, and then notice also there's that connection with the, the Rankine or the Brayton cycle, okay? So this is where we fall on this chart. The other one, this is next video, okay? So that is, now, what you might say when you're looking at this and look what was done here. Oh, I know what else I wanted to say. Sometimes what you'll see is instead of, um, now pay careful attention to the shape that the green figure makes. Sometimes instead of using this way of making the shape by bringing the bottom up, what people will do is they'll bring this part down and flatten it, and then they'll shade this in. And so you'll see pictures that look like that. And this is to me misleading because it looks like what you're doing is you're getting a better cycle in terms of work, one that adds more work. The problem is that this is not as accurate, actually, what's happening thermodynamically. So notice that now if you take the overall shape, it's the same shape as the one in green, but you've made it way bigger. Uh, it's sort of valid, but it's, it's much better to think about creating that shape cycle the way that I did, okay? So I, I won't erase that, but I just wanna make that note. So we took this, our path, our process path from zero to one, that isobar, and we made this cycle by raising it. Well, what's to stop us from raising it even further? Okay, because we could keep pushing, we raised it up to the point where four was, right? We brought, we completely eliminated that process path. We pushed it up to chop that up. But we could keep raising it higher and higher up here. And I want to keep that in your mind because I want to draw a sketch of what that would look like if we did that, okay? So we'll try and do it here on the back board. While it's fresh in our minds, I'll try to sketch this. We had this, and we were raising and raising that line up until what if we hit, remember we had, we had a shape like this? But what if we raised it until we hit there and actually just made it sort of almost triangular. This is obviously um, not a straight line. That's an adiabat right there or an isentrope, I guess. An adiabat's more realistic to the real world. But we could end up with a cycle that looks like that. And that's really interesting because it's a cycle with only three legs to it. And it turns out there's a name for that cycle. It's called the Lenoir cycle. So now I will try and drop in some points and actually define this cycle for you. I just wanted you to see like how it was connected to the Atkinson cycle because it very much is. Okay. So this is, we can mark where the heat comes in and where the heat goes out. This right here, Q in. Right, heat's going up through that ISO core. So process one to two. Isochoric heat addition. Okay? Process two to three. Oh, oh, and we want to mark this on here as well. So we have something like this. Isochore, that's a line of C V that's pretty steep like this up to here, okay? All right, um, now the next thing we do is we come down two to three. Now this is not an isotherm. I already mentioned it was like an isentrope or an adiabat. So in the most perfect case, an isentrope, which means it's a line of constant entropy. Um, 
and we're not going to want it to come down all the way. So this was one, this is two, this is three. So I'll mark that here, that two to three, we have isentropic, and then what is it doing? Well, it's expanding. Volumes increasing during that step. So we have isentropic expansion. Okay? Now to return, three to one, it's an isobar. So it's isobaric, and this one is the heat rejection or heat removal. Okay, because this is where the heat leaves. And remember that on this graph, we have an exponential curve for isocores, which is steeper, but for isobars, it's the same exponential curve, just less steep. So it still gets this, doesn't the curving nature, I want that to come through. It's still curving, it's still the exponential curve, it's just not as steep as the isocore was. All right, and that completes the shape. So here is where the heat is rejected out during that step. So this is a nice, neat little um, three-stage, or I'll, I'll say three-process cycle. And we can actually calculate the uh, efficiency of it. And we know that we have to start with one minus Q, oh, I messed this up last time, Q out over Q in. Okay, I got it right this time. So using an ideal gas approximation, again, all these are ideal cycles. So Q out, well, that's this step, which is isobaric. So it's MC, and since it's isobaric, constant pressure, we're gonna use the specific heat at constant pressure. And then delta T, well, uh, that's T3 minus T1 as the change in temperature during that step. For the Q in stage, that's one to two, and that's at constant volume, so we use CV. And then during that stage, the temperature change was T2 minus T1. And that's correct. And then the only thing that we can eliminate here is the mass is canceled. So here is your final formula for the efficiency of the Lenoir cycle. Okay, now the work of this cycle, I'm not gonna write a formula. I didn't write a formula last time either. It's just gonna be the area, again. Remember that the area of this curve on the, on the graph is the work. And the efficiency here, this, if you uh, try to compare it against an Otto cycle or an Atkinson cycle, or we're gonna talk about a diesel cycle, the efficiency is lower than all of those. So this isn't used in practice to make car engines. Uh, the thing that it is used for is a pulse jet engine. Now, a pulse jet is not actually a jet engine. Like, a jet engine is a different thing. Pulse jet, though. In that case, jet is just referring to the pressure wave that comes out because there is um, a pressure wave. Okay? And so, that is its main use. And these things are just fun to make. People make them on YouTube. So, I'm going to even make a note. to go ahead and look up on YouTube pulse jet engines, and you can see people building them and talking about them and filming them and all kinds of things, okay? So to finish off for this video, we had this Atkinson cycle. Well, the Lenoir cycle is like the Atkinson cycle taken to its extreme. We keep chopping off and getting that um, exhaust or that intake stroke shorter and shorter until we don't have an intake stroke anymore, okay? We just get that simple three-sided shape, okay? So it's not very useful when you go and take that to its extreme like that, but it is interesting to study because it's pretty simple, all right?
So we'll be back next time with our last video.